Welcome to API Conversations. It's January 2020, and this is your host, Paul Carr. This conversation and the one to follow are with Eric Wojciechowski. He's the author of a couple of novels, and the one we'll be talking about most is Chasing Disclosure. Eric has, as you will hear, investigated a lot about ancient astronauts and UFOs, and there's a great deal of that in his novel, Chasing Disclosure. We'll talk about a lot of things in this conversation, and so rather than trying to sum it up for you, I'm just going to get started. Again, this is Eric Wojciechowski, and I'll have links in the show notes at apicasefiles.com, where you can find out more about Eric, more about his books, more about other things he's written, and we'll see you on the other side of part one of a conversation with Eric Wojciechowski, or let's just call him Eric from now on, shall we? Test, test. Okay, we are recording. All right. All right. Excellent. Excellent. I'm sorry about all this. It's very stress. It's been <laughs> it's okay. a been a very stressful evening. Uh, <laughs> Not a problem. I remember being heartbroken when I was like 16 or so and realizing I didn't know everything. And yeah, and, and that was that, uh, painful for me. That you know what's funny is that that actually dawned on me when I got into college and all of a sudden me being a goofball in high school wasn't good enough and just the mysteries of, uh, mysteries of the world were what I was interested in. <laughs> and um, and that sort of led me to everything that we're about to talk about. So. I almost thought about just like calling up some people I know and say, come on in and let, let's talk with Eric. <laughs> but the spirit, well, of the, know, the spirit of the API conversation is one-on-one. But, yeah. Uh, well, what we could do is we could always do that like another time. Like if this one goes over well yeah. and uh, you know people are interested, we could always just add to it and we could do more. That's sure. Cool yeah. Too. Well, th- we're gonna add a, have a live uh, show coming up. Uh, oh, is this the one um, where you were looking for like basically a conference only instead of us going to a hotel somewhere in the United States? It would be virtual. Well, yeah. That oh, I mean that's a bit bit ambitious but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh the the the, uh, the idea would be that we would have uh uh people could come in and think a nice thing about zoom if it ever works again uh oh, yeah. is is uh that it zoom will zoom will uh allow you to me to have at least up to 100 participants so somebody mm. says oh i want to come in and ask a question mm. I, I could just i could just bring them in to the conference uh have them muted and then unmute them and let them ask their question and mute them again or, or say goodbye to them. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, I have total control over that. And, uh, so we could have people almost like questions from the audience. And, and uh, now usually when I, when I talk at a conference, I talk so long, there's no time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> in spite of, in spite yeah, of my could... good intention to leave 15 minutes at the end, but, you know, I, I, t- there's always, I, I don't plan well. If I rehearsed maybe 20 times, mm-hmm. I could get it down to where, okay, this is a 45 minute talk, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I, but anyway, I, what I want to talk about is, uh, I have some questions related to chasing disclosure. Okay. Sure. May, may go back kind of into your past a little bit. Okay. But, you know, uh, and then, uh, no spoilers. Um, well, I mean, if you, if, if there's a spoiler, I'll edit it out. Because, yeah, uh, it's but, one of those things where the yeah the book's been out for over two years now, and it's sort of like a television show or something, or sort of like uh, after a while, um, it's like uh, how many people who want to read it haven't read it? Well, it's going to be a spoiler. Uh, yeah, so I do my well, best. Well, you know, it, it's it's <laughs> it's it's kind of like there are still people if you tell them, oh, Snape killed Dumbledore, they, they'll get mad because they haven't read, <laughs> they don't they don't, haven't gotten that far in Harry Potter yet. <laughs> I haven't seen that movie. Right, yet. yeah. So it's like, yeah, you know, Jaws didn't win. Okay, well, <laughs> what's the statute of limitations? <laughs> okay, we'll do yeah, our best. Let's here. give it twenty years. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, Maybe I'll have know, the sequel out by then. Uh, gosh, there's there's so many things I've read and watched over the years. I can't remember the endings of most of them, but uh, <laughs> mm. yeah, 
Yeah. Doctor Who did not get killed in that episode. (laughs) (laughs) I can tell you that without being a spoiler. (laughs) Well, the the thing is, is that I haven't even read my own book in, uh, well, since I did the the, the final editing, which was around uh, November of 2017. So there's some things that when I go through it quickly, when somebody points something out, I'm like, I I wrote that? Because what happens is that you write a book, you know, a story or an article, and then you move on to the next thing. And as time goes by, you almost forget what you've written. But uh, so, so if yeah. I, I doubt I'll spoil anything because the big stuff is probably something I'll remember, like the ending. <laughs> well, the the ending we won't spoil. Uh, <clears throat> right. Which the ending left me a little bit depressed, by the way. But uh, I think you know that already. Well, my, yeah, yeah. Um, it's dark. Uh well, well uh, wow I mean well we could we could save this for the conversation until we're recording <laughs> but uh, oh we are recording I, uh right I'm gonna okay. say I'm just consider it started I'm just gonna edit out the preliminary stuff sure uh, okay yeah the the uh well we won't we'll go to the ending but I do have some questions and one of them is um there's a lot of uh kind of stuff about Sumerian mythology in in the book. Uh, yeah, and I know you used to kind of be a Sitchin fan. Yes, uh, can you kind of get run us through that history of uh, you were pro Sitchin, then you changed your mind? Uh, yeah, sure, I can talk about that. Um, what happened was that um, back in my days in college, I got into just the mysteries of, of being human. Uh, I got in my psychology classes, and things were getting kind of exciting, and I decided to supplement my own studies with going to the library and uh, ancient Egypt was interesting um, so I picked up a book on that and it started looking like hey you know these the ancients knew more than we give them credit for at least more than I gave them credit for we got this idea that they're primitives and so uh, you know they couldn't possibly have done things like fantastic works of architecture like the pyramids by themselves they must have had help and uh, if if it, if they couldn't have done it, who helped them? So you got these two competing theories, the ancient astronaut theory and Atlantis. And the ancient astronaut theory just sort of, um, in hindsight, was more appealing because there was no real proof of Atlantis. So it had to come from elsewhere. That was my thinking back then. Um, so fast forward to getting through the books of Eric Von Donikin and some other stuff. And then I get to Zechariah Sitchin's 12th Planet. And I read The Twelfth Planet, and then I followed up with his second book, The Stairway to Heaven, and then I jumped into The Wars of Gods and Men, and then I believe, if I recall correctly, the fourth one is When Time Began, and then the uh, supplemental book, which was Genesis Revisited. And those books were available when I got into him back in about 1989, 1990. Uh, And then... I love those books so much. I thought they were so good and made the case so well. I think I read the first three, two, three, four times just because I was looking for holes. And by the time around 1994, I ended up working in a bookstore. I'm now out of college. I graduated with my degree in college or degree in psychology. And um, while I'm looking for a job to do that kind of work, I'm working in the bookstore. And I remember having a conversation with somebody saying that Sitchin was so good, we should put his stuff in the history section. And in hindsight, that's a bit of an embarrassing admission. But um, that's what I thought at the time, and that's all that I knew. And um, I worked with a guy who was a Mesoamerican archaeologist, but he did not have the money or the grant to go down there, to be down there and do work. So he was working in the bookstore until money came through. And of course I irritated the hell out of him because I would always bug him about the ancient astronaut society and he being professional and much more knowledgeable than me was always like, no, no, these aren't spaceships. This, you know, read more. And he gave me recommendations and I have those books to this day and I've read most of them. And, um, I started realizing that, um, Sitchin, like every other ancient astronaut theorist is masters at cherry picking. Uh, they they take what looks like astronauts, sounds like astronauts, they interpret things like astronauts, and they become astronauts, you know. So um, what happened was I was part of the Ancient Astronaut Society, and what that was was um, basically it was based in Chicago. It was run by Gene Phillips and uh, several other people. Um, they basically formed to explore Eric Von Donikin's ideas. 
And I became a member of that group. And part of that group had a uh, phone book as a member of the group. This was, this was member before the days of the internet, before even America Online, like 1990 something when I joined. So you had everything was done by mail. Uh, and if you had a fax in your home, you could get faxes, but I, my, all my stuff was by mail. But I received a letter in the mail because I allowed myself to be part of the phone book, which included phone number and address. I received a letter in the mail from a woman who was a member of the society, and she said, hey, let's all get together as part of the society. Whoever wants to participate, let's explore Sitchin's theories and find the pros and cons, <clears throat> and, and together we can sort of build on his theory. So I ended up writing back. And I started writing more cons. In fact, I wrote all cons, no pros. <laughs> I, found, I found that Sitchin had been cherry-picking his data. I found that his interpretations of pictures and myths were incorrect because now I had had a few years since. This actually occurred in about 1996, 1997. So from my initial um, – from about 1990 to 96, I had about six years to not only read Sitchin but investigate his claims. So by the time I received this woman's letter and replied – I was I was no longer as much of a believer and I was more of a skeptic and I almost didn't realize this till I started replying to her letter. After I replied to her letter, I realized if I had just changed some words, it could be an essay and I could probably find a magazine to publish it. And at the time I was interested in Skeptical Inquirer, I read them, I read Skeptic magazine, and I ended up writing this letter. Well, I turned it into the essay. And then I decided before I attempt to publish it, I'm going to give Sitchin the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to send it to him. And I'm going to say, look, here's my intentions. I'm going to seek publication. But in case I got you completely wrong, please let me know. And maybe we can just fix this instead of going back and forth in publication. Uh, he sent it back to me, the whole thing. Remember, once again, this wasn't an email return. This was the full thing in a manila envelope with a little note. And it basically said, I'm sending this back to you unread because I don't comment about anything that's not been published. So I thought, okay. So I sent it to Michael Shermer, a skeptic magazine. Michael Shermer accepted it. It went into, I believe, the 1998 edition, one, one edition in 1998. And um, since that time, I've been a Sitchin critic. And as far as I know, Sitchin, I don't know if Sitchin ever got around to reading the article. <laughs> he, he has passed away, I believe, in 2013. Um, but I've, I've never heard him um, – since that time though, since about 1998 though, there's been and, – and now that there's YouTube and the internet and so forth, I have found a lot of criticism, even better than mine, regarding Sitchin. But when I was writing mine, I had to go to the library and I had to bug librarians to help me do searches on everywhere Sitchin's name was to find every, anybody who would come before me. And there was very little back then. So um, – but now it's – now now there's um, much more in-depth work out there. But th that's my history with Sitchin. Yeah, and yeah, and in your, <laughs> in your in chasing disclosure, your novel. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's some. You have your protagonist uh, stumble across some, uh, some uh, Sumerian writing that that leads leads you know, forwards the plot down the road, uh, but it's all fiction, of course. So <laughs> it's perfectly all right. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what I did was I actually took, um, if I remember correctly, the um, the original poem, I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> it was either Akkadian or Babylonian. I believe it's the myth of Atrahasis. <clears throat> and I believe that I used that and then I just made up some stuff to go with it in order to create the, the story. Right. Um, but what I yeah what I wanted to do was take the ancient in in this book Chase and Disclosure I wanted to basically take the the ancient astronaut theory and have fun with it right. almost like uh, the movie Stargate only I thought Stargate was a little uh, well, it was Hollywooded you know I yeah, wanted to create sure. something I wanted to create more of a Raiders of the Lost Ark as opposed to Stargate right. <laughs> kind of thing and so I made up my own myths and and what what I had the biggest trouble with when I was writing the story was I wasn't really sure who the protagonist was going to be. Like, what was his profession? And, and without giving too much away, they end up finding this stuff in Iraq. So the question, of course, was, this takes place in relatively present day. How do I get my character into Iraq? All right, the, the geopolitics are hot. He can't really just be a tourist. I don't want him to be an archaeologist because that's too much Indiana Jones. I need to create something else. 
Oh, so the best thing to do was make him be a soldier. And he just happens to be on security of this detail. And he just sort of by chance comes across this stuff. And I thought that's the best way to do it, just sort of an accident, almost the way I've stumbled into the ancient astronaut yeah, theory now, myself. But s some of this book is autobiographical, right? I mean, uh, he he works in a bookstore. He has his well, that's right. Of psychology. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, you're picking that up. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. But he, you weren't a soldier, right? No, I, you know, if I if I have two regrets in my life, uh, one of them is that I did not do some kind of military time. I really kind of wish I had done that before college just to have the experience. And the other is travel. I should have traveled more um, in my youth. So I get to do that through my book. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would. I all have the same regret about travel, not about military. Yeah. But, uh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm just really not good at obeying people. That's my wife. <laughs> Uh, Understood. Yeah, or, 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 wear, or wearing uniforms or anything like that. But uh, anyway, uh, not, not to disrespect those that do, but uh, Sh sure. But uh, the uh, so there was a little bit of autobiography there. Uh, but now there was something in the novel that struck me. Well, two things in the novel that struck me really hard. Uh, mm. One one was delightful, and one was very negative. Okay. Uh, the negative. Let's start with the negative thing. Uh, sure. This this uh, protagonist of yours, um, I guess, has a bachelor's degree in psychology or something like that. Mm. But he pretends to be a therapist to get yes. a, get to get the story that he's looking for. Uh, we won't right. go. We'll go into the, what the story was, but he there's a witness that is has particularly important information for him, and he pretends to be her. He, he he kind of sets himself up as a therapist, and even lets her call him doctor, even though he's nothing like a PhD, right? Yeah, and right. and and uh, um, or an MD. And uh, th this this is very unethical. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's it's part of what I did with the character in Iraq was I sort of set it up to show that he isn't very ethical. <laughs> um, one thing that I've always liked about um, – part of my favorite literature is transgressive fiction. Uh, one of the best books that everyone is aware of is Chuck Palahniuk's Fight Club. Um, yeah. So what I like is a character who's <laughs> – I find characters interesting who aren't necess necessarily ethical. They're sort of a bit selfish. They live outside the norm. They get things done in a different way. So uh, this guy here, I sort of gave him – he's not really doing much. You know, you kind of get the idea he's an adult, maybe in his 30s when the story starts. He's working in a bookstore. He's not even management. Um, so he he's not got this major career to lose. He can kind of be anybody he wants to be. And the only thing that he's got any success at is the publication of this book. The book, uh, which UFO, is called, or well, the title of the book that he's wrote was Chasing Disclosure. Chasing Disclosure. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So okay, that's a, I should mention that's another thing I liked was the self-referential <laughs> title of the book. Uh, uh, yeah. It, it's, a, it's Chasing Disclosure. It's about chasing a book named Chasing Disclosure, which which is fictional. Okay. <laughs> that's right, yeah. And and in the book, he documents his own um, his own interest in UFOs, <laughs> but he's a skeptic in, in the beginning of the book. He's a skeptic. His book, Chasing Disclosure, is his sort of history on looking into UFOs and how they're not um, as mysterious as some people want them to be or think that they are, uh, which is my personal stand on it. And he ends up doing really well with this book, and that's where the story starts. Um, but he's also got this background with his past in Iraq and some of the unethical things that he did. Um, so when he finally gets an opportunity to perhaps confirm the last mystery that he's still holding out on, he goes for it and he does it unethically. <laughs> yeah. Now I, w I want to point out when I was reading the book, mm -hmm. I kind of was cheering for him to get the story, even though he was, what he was doing was misrepresenting <clears throat> his credentials and his capabilities uh, and possibly damaging a, a person. Uh, but I still want, I want to get I want him to get the story. This is so important. Yeah, 
because you yeah, said the like, way you set it up is it was uh, it's it's really incredibly important to get to the bottom of this. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of narrators in some stories. Like, okay, for instance, just off the top of my head, I'm going to say Hannibal Lecter. We all love the like we love Hannibal Lecter, and we shouldn't. We're all kind of rooting for him to get away in the movie Hannibal, and when he escapes at the end of Silence of the Lambs, I think Statue of Limitations are off. Everybody knows that one by now. Yeah. Uh, that he gets that he he gets away at the end of Silence of the Lambs. We're kind of happy about it, even though he's just the worst. Oh, he killed somebody to do that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> right and viciously, he's a cannibal, you know. So um, finding Lecter's a, a bad to, guy, by the way, young people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't be like him. Uh, but so, so the challenge was to write a char- write about a character who's not exactly the nicest guy, but that you're still going to root for. You know, you're you're going to want him to succeed despite the fact that he's not exactly in it to help this girl. <laughs> he's in it just to get the story. Yeah, I mean, I think he cares about her, but he doesn't really. You know, that doesn't change the fact that he's. He's kind of messing around with with her uh, and possibly yeah. even damaging her. Yeah, I'm, I mean, we didn't talk about this. So just just for somebody who's not uh, you know familiar with the story, the story starts off with with a plane crash and the plane comes down. It's a passenger plane. The plane comes down in a cornfield and it looks like it's been crushed while it's in the air uh, as if uh, a tin can had been squeezed. Um, and that's the mystery. What happened up in the sky that caused the plane to look like this? And she, she's one of the survivors of, of the. Uh, yeah. In the, fact, she's the only one who remained conscious from the time it happened to the time it landed, besides the two pilots who had their masks on. But the pilots aren't talking because the, the airliner says you can't because we're going to face a lawsuit. And of course, all government agencies are investigating. So the airliner zips the pilots. And the only one who's going to talk is this seven year old girl who was conscious from beginning to end of that crash that's why he goes after her and that's where the story starts yeah and i i get the sense he does care about her but uh but and he feels like getting to the bottom of her story will help her in some way uh yeah but maybe that's a bit delusional on his part uh but- yeah he's yeah he he wants to get to the story he he doesn't mind being unethical and getting to it but at the same time, it's almost like spanking your child. You don't want to do it, but it's for their own good kind of thing. But he just he's just a little messed up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we we're, this is meant to be a spoiler free discussion. So we won't if you haven't read Station yeah. Disclosure, uh, we won't tell you how that comes out. But, uh, you know, now one thing I did think of right away was, oh, my gosh, this happens all the time in abduction cases. Uh People over the therapist sort of misrepresenting the- their their credentials as therapists when they're not. Yep. When they're oh, not. That's why. That's why I had no problem writing the character like that because I thought they're doing it all the time. You had you had Bud Hopkins, who was an artist. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and Jacob he's Jacobs, therapy. who's an historian. Uh- <laughs> right. And they're doing hypnosis and, th- and therapy. Sure. In, in fact, it takes place in Michigan because I'm from Detroit, so I decided to put it in Detroit instead of. Los Angeles or a big city that everyone wants to write about. So I put it in Detroit. And so I did a little research on Michigan law on what it takes to be a therapist. Like, could this character who's got no credentials pass it off? And I found out you can call yourself a therapist in Michigan without having any credentials at all. You just can't call yourself doctor or you can't put MD, but you can call yourself a therapist because you could be into holistic medicine or hypnosis or anything like that. So I was like, okay, my character can pull this off because there's not, he doesn't have to show any papers. Oh, now that I do not know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's kind of disturbing. So if yeah. you're looking for counseling, you might want to check this out. <laughs> uh, uh, about three years ago, I went to a really good talk on on sleep paralysis, uh, mm-hmm. and the uh, by a PhD psychologist. And mm-hmm. afterwards, I approached him and I said, "Okay, what what? Uh, I, I'm cons- I do occasionally come across people who are." Uh, have these kinds of memories, uh, you know, of abductions or whatever. Uh, mm. How can I assure that they uh, don't end up going to some bogus memory recovery therapist who ends up messing up, destroying their lives? <laughs> and he goes, well, uh, yeah. most PhD psychologists understand that, you know, 
they know about the satanic panic and and all the mm-hmm. other, other things that happened and and alien abductions and they they don't do hypnosis for recovering memories they might do hypnosis for things like stopping smoking but not mm. yeah not uh right. not recovering memories yeah right even freud if my understanding is even freud gave up hypnosis towards the end of his career because he realized that it was planting as opposed to recovering um I heard uh, recently an interview with uh, Elizabeth Loftus. I believe it was Mick West who just had her on his podcast about two months ago. But Loftus has been doing some great work since. Uh, well, I know career. Lawrence Krauss had her on his podcast uh, recently. Krauss did too. Okay. I, yeah. I, was it Krauss? No, I believe it was Mick West. I heard. It could have been both of them. <laughs> Yeah. 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 At any rate, yeah, Loftus. Um, yeah, her research has, if it shows anything at all, is that uh, you can plant memories, and you don't even need hypnosis to do it. You just no. need to eat a lot long enough. I don't think she's ever know? used hypnosis. It's always been just suggestion. You know, sure. Uh, in a perfectly normal waking state. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and things like, uh, or it can be simply as simple as. Um, you know, they show they show somebody uh, uh, a video of a, a car wreck, mm-hmm. and they'll use a different word to ask the question of what happened in the car wreck, and they'll get a different response of what happened. Uh, it, it can be that simple. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I've discovered this just in my own life, just recalling something I did as a teenager or my early 20s. Um, you know, I might have told the story to coworkers that were, you know, something that was funny. And then I'll meet the friend that I was with. You know, I'll see this person at a grocery store or we get together 15, 20 years later. They come into town. We get together for coffee. And I'm like, you know, the story I'm always telling all the time is this, this and this. And they go, that didn't that, you weren't even there. That was my story. And then I think about it, I'm like, oh, my God, you're right. So, I, yeah, I've experienced this firsthand that that, that wasn't my story even. That was yeah, your if, story. If you live long enough, you will <laughs> you will encounter situations that you remembered wrong, and you'll have evidence oh, of that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, and childhood memories in particular are just uh, hit or miss. Yeah, it's funny. I I personally have never had sleep paralysis. I um, I I do have night terrors, of which I'm not aware of. My wife tells me about them the next day, but I don't have any. Um, never had sleep paralysis. The only thing that I've ever actually experienced in my childhood, and I can't even tell you how old I was, possibly seven, maybe eight was um, seeing a shadow person in the hallway. When I woke up at night, my brother was screaming, had a nightmare. I looked down the hallway. I'm sitting up in my bed. I could see down the hallway, and I saw what looked like a shadow person rocking back and forth, sort of like, you know, standing up in my doorway, rocking back and forth. And I remember just freezing and throwing my head under the covers, and when I pulled my head out, he was gone. That's my memory. Now, whether that ever happened, I can't tell you, because that was decades ago for me. Yeah, well, children live in a fantasy world anyway. I mean... That's right. Uh, which is nothing wrong with that. That that's how children are supposed mm-hmm. to be, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, they. So some of the memories are going to be memories of things you imagined, and that that's fine. Just don't yeah. just don't expect them to be accurate. Uh, right. Yeah. And I don't take that experience and say, well, that's confirmation of the shadow people. I just take that as experiences. Here's what I remember. Right. It's for all I know, a waking dream, and the closest I ever got to one. Yeah, well, I mean, the character, your character in Clancy Disclosure, the young girl, mm-hmm. yeah. it's, it's very difficult to disentangle what she sort of fantasizes and what's really happening to her. Uh, if, if, many times in the novel, I'm thinking, okay, she just imagined that, and then you kind of give some some reason to believe, no, she it's it was actually more than just her imagination. And, uh, you know, it, even... At the end, you still don't know exactly what she imagined and and what what really happened to her. Uh, yeah, you have some suspicions, but <laughs> you know, you're not, yeah, with, you're not there, you're not with, present for her when she's there. You know, yeah, yeah. Without giving away the ending, um, I struggled with. I felt at the time there were only two possibilities. I for about a year I was writing the book as I was approaching the ending. I was like, okay. You know, does she get abducted or doesn't she get abducted? How does how does this how is this book going to end? Um, what am I going to do? 
And the ending that I chose was one that I was like, you know what? I need to be more surprising. I need to, I, I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to my audience by having it predictable. So I chose the ending that I did. And um, everybody's been upset with me about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my own mother told me she cried at the end. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you made that choice. Uh, you must have known right, that but, was going to happen. Oh, uh, oh, well. Yeah, you know, again, without giving away the novel, I contacted when I had decided what I was going to do. I contacted a few authors that I talked to, and I said, "Hey, um, do you ever feel really bad when you do something bad to one of your characters?" <laughs> and they said, "Oh, we do it all the time. It's just, it's just the nature of the of the job." And I said, "Well, I don't see this this story really having a happy ending." And as you're reading it. I think people get the idea that something bad's going to happen. They just don't know what, but exactly what that's going to be. In, and I didn't want to be predictable, so I chose yeah. the ending that I did. And, um, yeah, everybody has done the same thing. They're like, I don't think I can forgive you for that. <laughs> well, you know, I was getting to the point. I got to that point. I thought, there's what? There's only 30 pages left? Uh, <laughs> there must be more to the story. And, yeah. uh, but, you know, well, if you, I've heard uh, interviews with J.K. Rowling. Where she not only is sorry about what happened to some of her characters, but she's also mm -hmm. like regrets certain choices she made, <laughs> even so, certain rom certain romantic yeah. hookups that that she thought maybe should yeah. have, shouldn't have been there, you know, uh, um, and, you know, and you know, it's not like it didn't work for her financially, <laughs> but that's right, yeah. Uh, well, the thing is that when you're writing fiction, not so much short, short stories because those come and go. You don't get inv yeah. as involved with these characters. But when you're writing a novel, at least for me, my novels so far, my first one took 15 years because I couldn't figure out exactly what to do with the first one. And then the second one only took about really from beginning to end about a year to write. But even then, you're still daily investing in these characters and they're yeah. talking to you. I mean, the dialogue that I'm generally writing is they're almost talking in my head and I'm just scrambling to write it down. I'm almost an interpreter. You know, I'm not a channeler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah ch it's almost like channeling, only I, you know, don't chalk it up to actual channeling. <laughs> um, but, but what happens is the characters, you know, stories that are plot driven are usually terrible. Um, you almost have to let the dialogue drive the story, let the characters talk, and then it almost just flows naturally once you get into the swing of things. So, um, basically, uh, oh, where was I going with this? I don't even remember. Oh, yeah. So the characters almost make their own decisions at the end of the day because what happens is you're, you're like, I didn't really expect him to say that or do that. Or I'm really surprised. I almost surprised myself that it, uh, it came out that way. And I figure if I surprise myself and I'm writing it, I, I'll probably surprise the reader. So I've yet to have one person predict the ending of the book. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 have, I have to admit, I've not read your first novel, uh, Three Condoms for Sarah. Yeah. But I, the title is very intriguing. <laughs> Um, that book started off with a title. Um, I start basically that story is not erotica. It's not Fifty Shades of Grey. It's not at all. Oh it's, well, forget it then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's not at all. It's it's not a love story of bondage. Um, uh, it basically, what what that's well, you can only do so much with three condoms. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what it is is in a nutshell, it's a guy who doesn't do very well with women. Uh, so he creates a negative want a negative personal ad it's very blistering and th the wrong woman answers it that he decides to okay fine i'll entertain this and he ends up falling for her and he thinks he's got a shot he buys three condoms at a convenience store the first time he meets her and the story is sort of like what happens to these three condoms but he never gets a chance to use them on her <laughs> it's yeah, sort well, of a uh, you know uh, i that I could have written that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's sort of you know what's funny is I wrote that story before I even heard the word beta male. I mean, beta male is like something that we all know now, but right. back then I just called it was just the nice guy syndrome. You're just a nice guy, so you're never gonna get anywhere, kind of thing. So I sort yeah. of played with those ideas, um, and it started off with just some short stories writing uh, about these two characters. And um, then I was like, yeah, we could put this into a novel called Three Counters for Sarah. And um, 
there you have it. Um, and then, you know, once you do your first one, you're like, I think I could write a second one. And then I wanted something completely different. So I got going back into my history. Um, after I wrote the Sitchin article and I was done and got published in 98, I kind of felt like UFOs and ancient astronaut theory were sort of exhausted. Um, I had kind of come to where I needed time to make a conclusion of what I thought was going on and move on to a different subject. Well, after I finished my first novel, Three Counters for Sarah, and then I got into politics, and I was writing some politics and so forth like that. Uh, we got this political blog I write with my friend called Freedom Cocktail. It's a libertarian conservative bent. I'm more of a libertarian. He's more of a conservative. Um, I wanted something sort of different. I'm like, oh, I feel like I need something different. I need away from politics and, and identity politics and so forth. And I'm like, you know what? It's been like 10 years since I visited ufology. And now we have YouTube and we got Twitter. And I'll bet I can find a whole bunch of lectures that weren't available to me in the 90s because back then – you just didn't have broadband internet and YouTube wasn't around and you really didn't have the videos you got. So I started off, of course, with Stanton Friedman, you know, and uh, it's funny because I'm watching it in 2016. I'm watching a Stanton Friedman presentation he did in like 2014. I'm like, this is the same thing he's been presenting in the 90s. He had the same or the or, 80s or the 70s. Yeah, yeah. He was reading the same script, telling the same jokes. But then I also was like, okay, who who's new in this field who wasn't around when I was into it? And I found Richard Dolan. And I found his UFOs on the National Security State. And I'm like, I'm going to start with this. And I really like that book. It's a really good book um, as far as the history of things. Yeah, it's <clears> pretty, <throat> and, uh, I read it. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, and I really liked it. So then I launched into Crash at Corona by Friedman, who I didn't read that back then, but I decided I'd revisit Roswell for a bit. And I just started rolling with stuff. And uh, Jack Brewer's The the Grays Have Been Framed um, got into that and, um, you know, started uh, hanging around in Twitter with uh, the UFO crowd. And mm -hmm. I said, you know what I'm going to do for my second novel? So what I wanted to do, I always wanted to contribute to this field of ufology and ancient astronaut theory. I always wanted to write something. But I found that with all the notes I was taking and the Sitchin article I had done, which criticized his work, that I couldn't – if I was going to write a nonfiction book, I would just be regurgitating the same stories everybody's heard over and over. We've all – you know, every UFO book talks about Randallstrom Forest and – uh, Sakara and uh, yeah, Roswell is always in there. Here's one. Here's one spoiler. I'll give you chase and disclosure. And nowhere in there is Roswell mentioned because I'm sick of that story. <laughs> I decided to purposely avoid talking about Roswell in that in the book because it's so um, uh, so popular. I threw in some less known um, less known cases. I thought yeah, would be more yeah. interesting that I that I personally enjoyed. Um, but um, so I figured if I was going to write or ever contribute to this field that I enjoyed, uh, I, I didn't want to just be reinventing things and putting a different color cover on it. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell – I'm going to try to tell the story of ufology as I enjoy it. But I'm going to create these fictional characters to take the reader along. So if you don't know anything at all about ufology, you can still enjoy the story. And if you do, you can say, oh, I know that. I know that. This is familiar territory. I know that. Sort of like what James Cameron did with the movie Titanic. He took these fictional characters and put it in a historical setting. So you could follow these characters and you would know the story. So I, you know, I kind of figure if you don't know or care about ufology, like my wife, she doesn't know anything about this stuff. So when she's reading the book, she was more interested in the story between the narrator and the little girl. She wanted to see that dynamic. But when I started bouncing into history and ufology, she was sort of like tuning out. On the other hand, people who were into UFOs would get into all of it. <laughs> yeah. like, I, I remember this story. I write that one. Yeah, and so forth. So Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. And, and there was one other thing that in the book that took me by surprise, but I was delighted to see, which mm. was – your reference to the the disappearing stars work of Beatrice Via Rolel and and her her uh, colleagues. Uh, yeah, I can tell you. Oh, well, yeah, um, yeah, I can actually tell you if you'd like. We can discuss that. Sure. Um, how? <clears throat> well, I, I, well, my other podcast, we've done two two episodes on that, so <laughs> I'm pretty yeah, well informed. Um, I was not – okay, as I was writing Chase and Disclosure, of course I wanted the characters to come to conclusion. And um, I didn't know what I was going to conclude. 
you know, I had no I, – I started just writing this story about this plane crash, the survivor, and this narrator who's written a UFO book who gets a hold of her and pretends to be her therapist, does become her therapist, and they're working it out. So exactly how is this going to end? I had no idea. So what exactly is the UFO phenomenon? Are there really flying saucers? Are there aliens abducting people? Uh, you know, I had to try to figure out how to answer all these questions so that the re you know, I'd give the reader something. And prior to even writing Chase and Disclosure, I had read a book called um, Our Final Invention by James Barrett. And I can't recommend it anymore. It was so good. It's about artificial intelligence and where it's going and the possible dangers that we're going to run into if we don't do this properly. Um, it's not necessarily not necessarily going to be a Terminator type future or Matrix, but it could decide that it doesn't really um, want to be our slave anymore. Yeah. And one part in that book was discussing that how it could actually outperform carbon-based life forms because it's not limited by the environment and that it doesn't need to be here. It can be living in the coldest, deepest parts of space and rebuilding and re, re, retooling itself just on natural resources floating around in the form of asteroids and small moons and planets that human beings can't step on. Um, and I thought, wow, this race of artificial intelligence roaming the universe, just sort of doing what it's programmed to do out there in the coldest parts of space, what exactly... Where's it going to get its energy? And I can't even remember how I actually came across the work that you just referenced from from oops, it's Uppsala University, right? Or, uh, she uh, she uh, was she was a grad student Uppsala when she published it. Uppsala, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I came across that where they're doing this research uh, at the university, looking for possible Dyson spheres. And for the benefit of the audience, a Dyson sphere is building a basically um, a, a, a cocoon around a star and harnessing the complete energy that that star has. So you're not just throwing solar panels on your roof. You're taking the entire star. So I thought, well, if there's a race of machines out there and they need infinite energy, the best thing for them to do is, continue, is to start harnessing stars. And I run into her work. And she's looking for possible stars that were once photographed decades ago that are no longer there and trying to find out is it possible that we're looking at a Dyson sphere that wasn't there before that is now now there. And that's when I was like, I think I know I think I know what we're gonna do here. Uh, this, I, see. <laughs> I would you know. like to point out that she's a a highly trained astronomer who doesn't doesn't ju jump to conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> she did find one star one star that uh was missing from some old plates that uh was no longer no longer visible on the newer plates and uh so that yeah. that's that's kind of the the start of that yeah right yeah when i read that study i believe it was in 2016 <laughs> i threw an email and i said um i need to, i'd like to know all the information about this and she was she was very cautious about what was found she was like i'm not even sure this is a star it could be an artifact that's on the film no, um, she's a good scientist she she's oh, not gonna yeah. not gonna jump to conclusions yeah. yeah, this wasn't a talking head on ancient aliens. The, you know, this was a we're going to do a legitimate scientific study through the means of astronomy to find to see if we could find a Dyson star. And everything that I've read from her is quite frankly over my head. I'm I'm not smart enough to even understand it. It's a lot of math. It's a lot of astronomy. And I'm just like, give me the executive summary. That's the best I can do. I'm writing a fiction book and that's all I need. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so with that information, um, I decided to start pursuing down that path with the story. Yeah. Well, that was, I thought that was just a really cool thing. Cause I, uh, and I had interviewed her for my other podcast, uh, you know, when she was a graduate student, she's now, Ooh. she's now a postdoc, uh, working okay. in, in the Canary Islands. And, uh, was that where she is now? Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Um, She's uh, she, although she was from Sweden, she's like her father's actually from Chile, so she's got this complicated. Uh, she speaks Spanish fluently, and she's got this complicated okay. uh, uh, family history. But um, okay. 
she's uh she had, I interviewed her again last last fall, and she they found okay. quite a few more stars uh, uh, that kind of meet that general criterion. Yeah, in fact, I have her paper right here. I thought we might discuss not necessarily the paper, but this topic, uh, the one that was just came out November thirteenth of twenty nineteen. In fact, yeah, yeah, and uh, once again. The abstract, I, I'm even struggling with because, once again, I'm not smart enough. <laughs> but, you know, it's a legitimate scientific paper, so. Yeah, it is. It is. And that, they did they did a lot of hard work uh, yeah. to, and she personally did a lot of hard work to, uh, but it's quite <clears> a lot. It's a large team of people they call Vasco. And what they're trying to yeah. do is, is find evidence of stars that were in the historical database that are no longer there. No that's right yeah and they actually did find a pretty good list of them uh and that doesn't mean you you can't say well okay that means aliens but you you can say that that that's worthy of follow-up and uh you know, yeah get... just because of yeah just because of star wars there uh on the film decades ago and is no longer there the wrong conclusion is to say well oh, there's a lot of possible explanations and you have to rule sure. them out one by one which uh, sure, yeah. takes funding and telescope time and yeah yeah uh, um, yeah so it, it, it's it's going to be a slow process uh, but she's very yeah, serious about it, finding about finding a, a, a techno signature there they're finding evidence that you know maybe in that list of stars which is not very long mm -hmm. there one of them or two of them whatever will have a uh, will have some evidence that the star uh, should be there and isn't, uh, and there's no yeah. natural process that can explain it. And, and that's, yeah, for me, yeah, yeah, for me, the in, the interesting thing is that um, you know when I take a look at just human beings and space travel, we're struggling just to get to Mars. You know, I mean, we could yeah. do it, plant a flag and come home, but what's the point? It's a lot. You know, there's a lot of risk and a lot of money. You know, what what's the point really? the best we've been able to do is with machines. So the next step is to create some fantastic artificial intelligence to do that work for us. And there's no risk and they can survive without oxygen and everything we need to, you know, there's no food necessary, none of this stuff. <clears throat> so, you know, the thought that we're probably more likely to run into an artificial intelligence machine type creature roaming the galaxy um, and harnessing stars and so forth because it just doesn't have the limitations that carbon-based forms do. So, um, yeah, going after things like what she's going after, these uh, these missing stars, is a great, a fantastic pursuit. Well, I'm really excited your, about it. You put it. your finger on a, a, on a controversy I find fascinating, which is mm -hmm. uh, does humanity have a future as a biological organism or yeah. will we – give way to eventually i mean th this kind of general artificial intelligence people talking about is not going to happen when kurtzweil says it's going to happen it's, it's still, yeah it's still far off in the future but uh yeah. it, it's you know it could happen it's a question of is it 20 years or 100 years it's not not a question of whether is it yeah 20 years or never uh right and uh the other the other thing is you know during that transition period which i expect to be slow uh, will we find a way to keep our species going through them? You know, that's a fascinating question. I probably won't be around to find the answer, but yeah, it, uh, it, it's me either. Um, possibly. Um, but I mean, we're also, we're already augmenting ourselves. I mean, aren't we, you know, Oh, sure. We we'll, we'll be doing that for, for a long time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, from something as simple as dental aids to hearing aids to, glasses. um, yeah. yeah, glasses. Even going back, you know, several. Yeah, hundred years well, yes, we've things. been augmenting ourselves for for yeah. genera generations. You know, everything we do that's not a natural biological function, you know, that tool, a means of extending ourselves into the net environment, is an augmentation. And I've always argued that, uh, kind of, kind of emotionally and not rigorously, but I've argued that. These, these uh, machines that will exist hundreds of years from now uh, will be us. Uh, they, they will be, they will be our, our legitimate descendants, in, even though they may not have our DNA. And, and uh, 
<coughs> uh, or they, the pop, they may have some part of them <laughs> that is a, our, our DNA. Yeah, it could be a it could be a combination. Well, I think we'll break it there for part one and part two. We'll pick up the conversation again. It'll be out soon. For more information, please go see apicasefiles.com. If you have any questions, comments, other feedback, you can email us at apicasefiles at gmail.com. Or if you want to send an encrypted email, go to reportaufo at protonmail.com. That's the email address you should use. If you want to report a UFO sighting or a UFO experience, please go to reportaufo.org. There's a simple form there you can fill out, and then we'll get back to you and we'll start the investigation into what it is you actually experience. You will, of course, be treated with great respect, and your personal information will be kept completely private. So stay tuned for part two of my conversation with Eric Wojciechowski on API Case Files Conversations. The music for this episode has been by DJ Spooky and the podcast API Case Files and API Conversations are both released under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license.